Welcome back to the studio for lesson number five. Now, this lesson covers procedures, airport operations, and flight physiology. We'll discuss the important procedures you must be aware of when flying in the vicinity of an airport, as well as the devices and services available to you at airports to help make your job as a pilot in command a little easier. Flight physiology deals with the human side of flying. You need to be aware of how situations and the environment can impact your thoughts, feelings, and your physical well-being, and most importantly, how the environment can affect your flying. You also need to learn how to react appropriately and manage stress inside and out of the cockpit. Here's what we'll cover in this lesson. Airport Facility Directory Airport Markings Airport and Aircraft Lighting Surface Operations Traffic Patterns Maneuvers Collision Avoidance Special VFR Flight Physiology and finally Aeronautical Decision Making Now Let's pick it up with our instructor, Robert Bremer, as he covers the Airport Facility Directory. Hello, I'm Rob Bremer, your ground instructor for Procedures and Airport Operations. Now, the Airport Facility Directory is a great place to find official information about airports. The Airport Facility Directory is designed primarily as a pilot's reference to all airports, seaplane bases, and heliports that are open to the public. It includes information about communications and frequencies, navigational aids, and special notices and procedures. The airport facility directory is divided into booklets for different regions and updated versions are published by the FAA every 56 days. Now, here's an excerpt from an airport facility directory. Because the information in the airport facility directory uses many abbreviations and symbols, you need a legend to understand the details. Each copy of the airport facility directory includes a legend and you'll also find a key in the computer testing supplement. Let's take a closer look at some of the essential information for a typical airport. In this case, Lincoln Municipal Airport. I'd like you to notice it's four miles northwest of the city. This section right here provides information about the runways. You can see that the runways available at Lincoln Municipal are 17 right, 35 left, 14, and runway 32. The runway numbers are based on the magnetic heading most closely aligned with the runway direction. As we'll discuss later, in a standard traffic pattern, all turns are made to the left. Note that the listing for runway 17 right, which you see right here, indicates that you should fly right traffic when using this runway. Right hand traffic means that all turns in the traffic pattern are made to the right. Now, let's take a look at the communication section of the airport listing, which we see right here. When the tower is in operation at Lincoln Municipal, you use the frequency shown right here, tower 118. The hours of operation are shown in parentheses following the tower. In this case, it says 11.30 to 06.30 Zulu. That's what the Z stands for, Zulu time. When the tower is closed, you use the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency, or CTAF, to make position reports. At this airport, you use 118.5 when the tower is closed. Now, you want to note this information carefully because sometimes the CTAF frequency differs from the tower frequency. Next, notice that Lincoln Municipal Airport lies within Class C airspace, so you must establish communications with approach control. You can find the approach and departure frequencies in this section. Two frequencies are available right here, and we'll go into some detail. Which one you use depends on where you are relative to the airport. If you're approaching from the west, 170 degrees through 349 degrees right here, you would use frequency 124.0. If you're arriving from the east, 350 degrees through 169 degrees, 
you would use the initial contact frequency of 124.8. Welcome back. Let's take time for this question on airport facility directories. When approaching Lincoln Municipal from the west at noon for the purpose of landing, initial communication should be with which of these three? Only one correct answer. Okay, let's answer that question. When approaching Lincoln Municipal from the west at noon for the purpose of landing, initial communication should be with C, Lincoln Approach Control on 124.0 megahertz. A little further explanation here. Remember, Robert just told you, arriving aircraft landing at airports within Class C airspace should contact approach control from outside the Class C airspace on the specified frequency. First, determine which of the two approach controls should be contacted based on the time of day. Next, identify the frequency for which the aircraft's arrival direction. Notice that the aircraft approach from any direction between 170 and 349 should make contact on 124.0 megahertz. We are very happy to have in the studio with us today Laurel Lippert. Laurel will be talking about procedures and airport ops. She earned her instrument and multi-engine ratings and her commercial and flight instructor certificates. Now with co-author Greg Brown, Laurel wrote a book called You Can Fly, a very colorful and inspiring guidebook to understanding and appreciating the process of learning to fly. Laurel, we welcome you to the studio. Thank you. Now, as a contributor to Pilot Getaways magazine, you've had a lot of experience traveling to new destinations. How do you prepare to fly to a new airport? It's always exciting for me to fly to a new airport. First of all, I'll take out a WAC and a sectional chart to get an overview of the airport's layout. I'll look at the terrain, the surrounding airspace, at uh, landmarks, proximity of towns and lakes, and then to see if there's any other airports nearby. And then I'll take out an airport facility directory to look at the airport's runways, runway services, lengths and widths, and I'll get more information there, such as obstacles, noise abatement procedures perhaps, and the calm wind runway. And then I will get more information and do some flight planning on uh, websites such as airnav.com, AOPA's real-time flight planner, and then I'll check weather on duots.com, which is a great uh, resource for weather, before I contact flight service. When I've called flight service, I have an overview of where I'm going and what I'm doing and what the weather is. Flight service confirms my weather report and gives me current notams and TFRs for that area. Let's move on to a new topic, and it's airport markings. We'll see you back here after Robert covers that topic. Now let's take a look at some of the markings and signs you will see at airports. A good place to start is an airport diagram like this one. There's a lot of information here. Airport layout diagrams are available for most airports. You can find them in the airport facility directory and other airport guides. They're especially useful for taxiing at unfamiliar airports because sometimes the hardest part about a flight can be finding your way around the airport after you've landed. This runway has an L after the digits, meaning it is runway 35 left. Busy airports often have parallel runways. Adding L for left or R for right to the numbers distinguishes runways that share the same magnetic heading. The parallel runway at our example airport is runway 35R or runway 35 right. Let's take a look at what this all means to the pilot. Let's continue with runway numbers. Now, here is runway 35 at Aurora State Airport. Runway numbers are based on magnetic heading. This is runway 35, which means that the runway is aligned to 350 degrees almost due north. This runway is aligned within plus or minus five degrees with a magnetic alignment of 350 degrees. The airport authorities rounded the direction to the nearest 10 degrees and then dropped the last zero. So this runway is runway 35. Now notice I said runway 35, not runway 35. With few exceptions, 
In aviation speak, we pronounce individual digits for clarity on the radio. Now let's take a closer look at how this numbering system works. Visualize a compass rose that encircles the airport. Here we're looking at runway 12. If you were to taxi onto this runway and line up with the center line, you would be pointing in a magnetic direction close to 120 degrees, that is, to the southeast. So the runway is named runway 12. Now here's another example. If you lined up or flew on an approach to this runway, you would be heading roughly 300 degrees, or 300 degrees magnetic. That means the runway is designated runway 30. Now here are some additional important runway markings shown on the airport layout. The starting point of a runway is called the threshold. Sometimes the threshold is not located right at the end of the pavement. For example, this white line that you see right here is called a displaced threshold marking. It shows the beginning of the pavement that can be used for landing. You should always touch down beyond a displaced threshold line. On some runways with a displaced threshold, single white arrows, like the single white arrows you see here, indicate that you can use the full length of the runway for taxi and takeoff. However, if a displaced threshold is marked with white or yellow chevrons, you cannot taxi on, land on, or take off from that part of the pavement that you see right here. This area is often called a blast pad or overrun area. It's usable only in an emergency. If you have an emergency, such as brake failure, and end up in that area, it's okay, but lights or other obstructions in that section of the pavement may damage your aircraft. Now, this area on the airport has X's that are painted on what appears to be a runway. If you're on a final approach and you see an X on the runway, that's your cue to go around because an X means that runway is closed. Often you'll see more than one X, like the two that we see here. If you do see an X, avoid that runway. It may be damaged, under construction, or be permanently closed. Let's move on and talk about the taxiways at an airport. Taxiways are named with letters A, B, C, and so on. And they have distinctive markings and signs so pilots don't mistake them for runways. Taxiways are typically marked with a solid yellow center line. At night, the taxiway edges are defined by blue lights or reflectors, which are visible from all directions. At large airports, some taxiways also include specific direction indicators and lights on the taxiway center line. Now, note that runway edges are marked with white lights. Remember, white lights show us where to land. Blue lights show us where to taxi. It's important for you to become familiar with the signs and markings used at both towered and non-towered airports. The signs use distinctive colors to help you understand them. Mandatory instruction signs have a red background with a white label. They mark the entrances to runways and other critical or prohibited areas on the airport. Location signs are black with yellow markings. They identify taxiways and other important areas on the airport. Now direction signs have a yellow background with black labels and arrows. Direction signs mark places where taxiways intersect runways or other taxiways and parking areas. Information signs have a yellow background with black inscription. These signs provide such information as communication frequencies and local noise abatement procedures. Runway distance remaining signs have a black background with white numbers like this four, which indicates 4,000 feet remaining. They show you the length of the remaining runway in thousands of feet. One of the most important signs is the runway 
hold position sign. These red signs with right runway numbers mark an entrance to a runway from a taxiway or another runway. Runway hold lines marked in black on a yellow background show you where to stop until it's clear to taxi onto a runway. You may not cross the double continuous line without ATC clearance or at a no-powered airport until you're sure that you have separation from other aircraft. Now, let's cover land and hold short or lasso procedures. They are given at tower-controlled airports with two intercepting runways. You must come to a complete stop before reaching the crossing runway. It's critical because it requires the aircraft to be stopped in the shorter runway distance. Precision landings are required. It's recommended that student pilots do not accept the land and hold short clearance. A go-around must be made in the first third of the usable landing distance and the pilot must inform the controller immediately. Now, let's check this example. Here we have an intersecting runway. The airplane must be stopped before the crossing runway that you see right here. As the pilot lands, note how he successfully completes a lasso by stopping the airplane before reaching the intersecting runway. Because land and hold short operations require precision landings, a student pilot should not accept a land and hold short clearance. In fact, even if you're an experienced pilot, if you have any doubt about your ability to comply with a land and hold short clearance, you must notify air traffic control and receive an alternative clearance. And if for some reason you must abandon an approach and go around, you must do so within the first third of the usable landing distance and you must inform the controller immediately of your intentions. Okay, welcome back. We've got a couple of questions for you on airport markings. Question number one. The numbers 8 and 26 on the approach ends of the runway indicate that the runway is oriented approximately which of these, A, B, or C? One correct answer. Okay, we hope you got the right answer. The numbers 8 and 26 on the approach ends of the runway indicate that the runway is oriented approximately C, 080 and 260 degrees magnetic. Now, as a reminder, the runway number is the whole number nearest one-tenth the magnetic azimuth of the center line of the runway, measured clockwise from the magnetic north. Got it? Good. Question two. When should pilots decline a land and hold short or lasso clearance? Which of these is correct, A, B, or C? You ready for the answer? Here we go. When should pilots decline a land and hold short or lasso clearance? The answer is A, when it will compromise safety. Pilots are expected to decline a lasso clearance if they determine it will compromise safety. Now, surface operations can be nearly as stressful as entering the traffic pattern at a new airport. What are some helpful ideas for pilots taxiing at a new airport? You know, it doesn't matter what size the airport is. When you're on the ground, you cannot see the runways and taxiways easily. So I familiarize myself with the taxiways, runways, the location of the fuel tanks, and where I will park in the airport facility directory before I take off. And then when I'm downwind, I'll orient myself and look again at where I want to be, where I'll be landing. Some smaller airports do not have taxiways, in which case uh, you will be back taxiing on the runway and you'll need to announce that to incoming and outgoing pilots. And always when you're on a taxiway or a runway, be looking around for other pilots, listening, monitoring the radio frequency to hear if they're when they're coming and going. And at a tower-controlled airport, you may be confused by taxi instructions. Lots of runways, lots of taxiways. Stop, don't move, and then call the ground controller and say you would like what's called a progressive taxi, which means that the controller will direct you 
assuming he, can, he or she can see you from the tower, tell you when to turn, when to stop, and where to go to park. Um, and in addition, if you're confused by airport signs and markings, you'll want to refresh your memory beforehand. Uh, there are flashcards available which can make that process uh, fun and, uh, and, and help your memory as well. Let's move on to a brand new topic. This topic, airport and aircraft lighting. We'll see you back here. Some airports have pilot controlled lighting. It's done by keying a microphone push to talk switch. Lights are on a timer. They're typically on for about 15 minute intervals. To activate the light system, you would click the microphone seven times within five seconds, like this. Voila, we have lighting, we can find our airport. This action turns on the airport lights at their highest intensity. You can dim the lights by clicking the microphone five times, like this. And our lights get a little bit dimmer. You can also dim it further by clicking three times for low intensity lighting. And now we have the lowest setting for the lights. It's also important to note that airport lights are typically on a timer. After you turn on the lights, they stay on for about 15 minutes. If you're planning to stay in the traffic pattern and do touch and goes, click the lights on every couple of circuits to keep the lights from going out just as you flare for touchdown. This graphic depicts the airport rotating beacon light. Here's a green and white flashing light that's known as a rotating beacon. This beacon indicates the location of a civilian airport. Military airports have beacons that show a green light that's followed by two quick white flashes, green, white, and white. So how can you tell if an airport has a rotating beacon? You can find that information in the airport facility directory and on a sectional chart. Here's a close-up. The star at the top of the airport symbol tells you that there is a rotating beacon that operates from dusk to dawn. At some airports, the beacon is turned on during the day if the weather is below VFR minimums. Another helpful lighting system at airports is the VASI. VASI is usually found on the side of a runway. It helps the pilot by guiding the descent for landing. A series of colored lights may change through your descent. Now, I want you to note in the examples that the size has been exaggerated. The first type of VASI is the two bar system. Here's a two bar VASI on the left side of the runway. It has two rows of colored lights, one on top of the other. When you see all white lights, you're too high, and you'll land long on that runway. When you see red lights over white lights, the aircraft is descending on the proper glide slope. To help you remember this arrangement, think red over white, you're all right. You're on the proper glide slope, and you're on track to land right where you want to. If you see all red lights, the airplane is too low, and you may land short of the runway or come close to an obstacle along the final approach path. Here's another look at how a two-bar VASI appears from the pilot's perspective as you approach right on the proper glide path. Now, there's three things that I want you to notice. The perspective, the VASI, and the altimeter. Notice that we are red over white. We're all right. This next example shows what happens when your approach is too low. Note the flatter runway perspective, the red over red on the VASI, and your altimeter. Remember, red over red, you're dead. Now, let's take a look at what happens in an example when approaching too high. Note the steeper runway perspective. Also notice, besides the steeper perspective, our VASI lights are white over white, and look at our altimeter and how high it is this time. Let's move on 
to the tricolor VASI. It uses one more light that changes color. Orange indicates that you are too high. Green indicates that you are on glide slope and red indicates that you're too low. We're back in the virtual cockpit. Here's another look at how a tricolor VASI appears from the pilot's point of view when you're too high. I want you to notice three things. The angle from the high perspective, the orange tricolor light, and the altimeter. The tricolor VASI will stay orange as long as you remain high on the approach. This example shows a tricolor VASI on glide slope from a pilot perspective. I want you to notice three things. The perspective of the runway, the green tricolor VASI stays green, and your altimeter. In this example, we're going to look at how the tricolor VASI shows too low on the glide slope. I want you to notice three things. The red tricolor light, the flatter perspective, and how low the altimeter is. Here is the pulsating VASI. A flashing white indicates too high. A steady white light indicates that you're on the glide slope. And an alternating red and white flashing indicates a too low condition. Now, here's what this looks like from the pilot's perspective. We're back in the virtual cockpit. This example illustrates an above glide slope condition on a pulsating VASI from the pilot perspective. Again, I want you to notice three things. The higher runway perspective, the pulsating white VASI light, and the altimeter. This example shows the pulsating VASI on glide slope from the pilot perspective. Again, I want you to notice three things. The perspective of the runway, the steady white VASI light, and the altimeter. This example shows the pulsating VASI below glide slope conditions. Again, I want you to notice three things. The flatter runway perspective, the blinking red and white VASI light, and the altimeter. The precision approach path indicator, often called a PAPI, is another common lighting system that helps you fly a safe descent angle. Let's take a look at how the PAPI works. A PAPI has four lights in a bar at the side of the runway. Four white lights indicate that the aircraft is too high. If you see three white lights and one red light, you're slightly above the proper descent angle. Two white and two red lights indicate that you're on the proper glide path. And if you see one white light and three red lights, you're slightly below the ideal glide path. With four red lights, that indicates that you're definitely too low. Now here's an example from the pilot's point of view. We're back in the virtual cockpit. In this example, the PAPI is showing an indication when you are above the glide slope. I want you to notice three things. Notice the four white PAPI lights, the high perspective to the runway, and your altimeter. This example illustrates a PAPI indication from the pilot perspective when you are slightly too high on the glide slope. I want you to notice three things. The red and three white PAPI lights, the perspective to the runway, and the altimeter. This example illustrates a PAPI indication on glide slope from the pilot perspective. Again, notice three things. The two white and the two red lights, the runway perspective, and the altimeter. This example shows a PAPI indication slightly low on the glide slope. We're going to take a look and notice the three red lights, one white, the flatter perspective on the runway, and the altimeter. This example shows a PAPI indication when you are too low on the glide slope. I want you to notice three things. The four red lights, the very flat perspective to the runway, and the lower altimeter. When you're approaching a runway served by a VASI or PAPI, regulations require that you remain 
at or above the proper glide slope as shown on the Mazzy until it is necessary to descend below it for landing. Airplanes also have lights. Position lights located on the wingtips and the tail help you spot aircraft and determine which way they're heading. You must turn on these lights between sunset and sunrise. The left wingtip has a red position light. On the right wingtip is a green position light. The tail has a white position light. Aircraft also have a red or white flashing beacon located on the tail or on the top and bottom of the fuselage. Some new aircraft use strobes, flashing white lights on the wingtips in place of rotating beacons on the tail and fuselage. Let's see how these lights work in flight. Imagine that you're flying this aircraft and you see a green position light and a red flashing light. You need to know the direction the aircraft is flying in and how to avoid colliding with it. The regulations state that the aircraft to the right has the right of way. Because you see the other aircraft's green position light, you know that you're looking at its right wingtip. Let's take a look at that from the top view. This is you and your aircraft, and this is the other aircraft. Let's play a scenario and see how it works. The pilot of the other aircraft sees red light mounted on your left wing. That means you are to the other aircraft's right and you have the right of way. You can see that the aircraft to the left alters course. Your airplane continues on the original flight path. Of course, you should never assume that the other pilot sees you and will change course to avoid you. Here's another situation. Imagine you're flying in this aircraft and you see a red and green position light. This arrangement tells you that the other aircraft is directly in front of you on a head-on collision course. Who has the right of way in this situation? The regulations state that when two aircraft are approaching head-on, both aircraft shall alter course to the right. Let's take a look at one more situation. Imagine you're flying this airplane and you see a steady white position light or a flashing red beacon. That indicates you are following the other aircraft. If you're overtaking that airplane, you must pass well clear to its right. Okay, airport and aircraft lighting a big subject. Let's have a couple of questions on this. During a night flight, you observe a steady red light and a flashing red light ahead and at the same altitude. Now, what is the general direction of movement of the other aircraft? Which of these, A, B, or C, is correct? Okay, let's take a look at the answer. During a night flight, you observe a steady red light and a flashing red light ahead and at the same altitude. What is the general direction of movement of the other aircraft? The answer is A. The other aircraft is crossing to the left. Now, a little reminder here. Airplanes have a red light on the left wing tip, a green light on the right wing tip, and a white light on the tail. The flashing red light is the rotating beacon, which can be seen from all directions around the aircraft. If the only steady light seen is red, then the airplane is crossing from right to left in relation to the observing pilot. All right, let's take the second question here. An on-glide slope indication from a tricolor Vasi is A, B, or C. Only one is correct. You should have this one too. An on-glide slope indication from a tricolor Vasi is B, a green light signal. Below the glide path is red, on the glide path is green, and above the glide path is amber. Okay, tackling a new subject, this one, surface ops. We'll see you back here when Bob's finished. Remember that your airplane is affected by the wind, even when you're taxiing on the ground. Let's discuss some procedures to use so that you can operate safely in these situations. The procedures vary based on whether you're taxiing a tricycle-geared airplane or a tail-dragger airplane. A tricycle-geared aircraft has a steerable wheel in front. 
under the cowling. A tail dragger has a steerable wheel in the back under the tail. So let's take a look at some different scenarios. Here's a situation that can be dangerous in a small aircraft when there's a strong left quartering tailwind. You want to prevent that quartering tailwind from getting underneath the elevator and wing and flipping the plane. To prevent that from happening, you want to dive away from the wind. In other words, hold the elevator forward and move the control yoke or stick to the right. This action puts the aileron down on the left side and up on the right side. Let's take a look at a situation with a left quartering headwind. To keep the wind from flipping the airplane, hold the aileron into the wind and keep the elevator neutral, like you see here. In the cockpit, turn the yoke or stick to the left. Hold the elevator neutral. Taxing a tailwheel aircraft requires a slightly different technique. Here's the situation in a left quartering tailwind. Hold the controls as if you were turning away from the wind. In this case, move the yoke or stick to the right to move the left aileron down. Because you're in a tail dragger, you should also push the controls forward to hold the elevator down and pin the tail to the ground. Now, here is the left quartering headwind situation in a tailwheel aircraft. You should move the controls as if you were turning into the wind. Move the yoke or stick to the left to hold the left aileron up. Because you're taxiing into a headwind, hold the elevator up to help pin the tail to the ground. Okay, time for a question on surface operations. How should the flight controls be held while taxiing a tricycle gear equipped airplane into a left quartering headwind? A, B, or C, only one correct answer. All right, you have your answer, good. How should the flight controls be held while taxiing a tricycle gear equipped airplane into a left quartering headwind? The answer is A, left aileron up, elevator neutral. Give you a little fuller explanation here. When taxiing a nose wheel aircraft in the presence of moderate to strong winds, extra caution should be taken. For a quartering headwind, the elevator should be held in the neutral position and the aileron on the upwind side should be in the up position. Okay, moving on to a new topic. Our new topic, traffic patterns. We'll see you back here when Robert is finished. We follow the rules of the road when we drive cars. We use similar rules when flying airplanes, especially near airports. The traffic pattern establishes the traffic flow around an airport. A traffic pattern is a rectangular path around an airport based on the runway in use. As we've seen, you can find runways and traffic pattern information in the airport facility directory. Most airports use a standard traffic pattern with left turns at the end of each leg. If you're operating at a private airstrip, talk to local pilots to learn about that traffic pattern. Here's a 3D representation of the standard traffic pattern. On takeoff, the airplane flies the upwind leg. As the airplane turns left, it flies the crosswind leg. Another left turn puts the airplane into the downwind leg. As the airplane descends for landing in another left turn, it enters the base leg here. And as the airplane makes its last turn, it enters the final leg and then the airplane lands. A non-standard traffic pattern uses right turns, but it uses the same leg labels. The traffic pattern as seen from above illustrates this concept further. Whenever possible, you want to take off and land into the wind. This animation shows a wind from the east. Let's put your aircraft on the runway. As you climb after takeoff, you are on the upwind leg. After you cross the end of the runway, you make the first left-hand turn in the traffic pattern to the crosswind leg. 
you continue climbing and when you get about one half mile from the runway and the runway is about a 45 degree angle you turn left again to the downwind leg on the downwind leg the wind is at your back pushing the airplane as it flies parallel to the runway fly past the end of the runway until it makes another 45 degree angle and then turn left again to the base leg the base leg is important because it helps you set up the airplane to line up with the runway and it gives you a chance to check the final approach area to see if another aircraft is approaching the runway. The last left turn puts you on final with the airplane aiming for the runway. Airports have markings and other indicators to help you fly the correct traffic pattern. For example, here is a traffic pattern indicator called a segmented circle. The segmented circle is marked in a white dotted line with hook-shaped lines like you see here extending from it. A segmented circle is made out of wood, concrete, or other materials. And it's painted a bright color, so it's visible when you fly overhead to check the traffic pattern. A wind sock or other wind indicator is usually placed inside the segmented circle. Now we'll take a look at a graphic. This graphic illustrates the proper use of the segmented circle with runways 17 and 35. The segmented circle indicates that all traffic patterns for the runway for runways 17 and 35 should be flown on the west side of the runway. Now suppose you want to land on runway 35, which would be right here. In that situation, you would fly a right-hand traffic pattern. Now, suppose the wind is from the north. The segmented circle still dictates that the traffic pattern should be to the west. So in this situation, you must fly standard left traffic. As I mentioned earlier, whenever possible, you want to land into the wind. Wind indicators help you determine the direction of the wind and then pick the best runway for landing. There are three common types of wind indicators. First is the familiar wind sock, which you see here, and it's called a wind cone sometimes. You've probably seen this a lot of times at the airport. The wind fills the sock and indicates the direction that the wind is blowing. You always want to fly the aircraft out of the wide end of the wind sock. You can see this airplane is flying out of the open part of the wind sock. The next indicator is a wind tetrahedron. A wind tetrahedron points into the wind. So you want to land your aircraft in a direction in which the tetrahedron is pointing. The third type of wind indicator is a wind T. It's shaped like a miniature airplane and it indicates the direction in which the airplane should land, as shown here. Well, welcome back. Let's tackle a question now on traffic patterns. Now, this particular question is going to require you to visualize runway patterns and layouts and permitted turns. So let's have a look. An airport has runways 9, 27, 18, and 36. Now, assuming the wind is from the south and the segmented circle indicates all traffic must be west of the runway, which runway and traffic pattern should be used? A, B, or C? Only one correct answer. All right, got your answer? Let's tackle it. An airport has runways 9, 27, 18, and 36. Assuming the wind is from the south and the segmented circle indicates all traffic must be west of the runway, which runway and traffic pattern should be used? The answer is B, right-hand traffic on runway 18. Now, here's a reminder, aircraft should land into the wind and runways are oriented according to the magnetic course, so runway 18 is favored. All traffic must be west of the airport, so right-hand traffic is required. All right, let's move on to a brand new topic. And this topic, of course, maneuvers. Your flight instructor will teach you a few ground reference maneuvers early in your training. These maneuvers are designed to teach you basic flying skills and to show you how to keep from drifting off course in the wind. 
These maneuvers also prepare you to fly proper traffic patterns. Well, you're in luck. We don't have an FAA question for you on maneuvers, but this next topic is important. And that topic is collision avoidance. Collision avoidance needs to be done correctly. And the best tools you have are your eyes. And the best way to use them is to take a look about every 10 degrees right here and pause and look, pause and look, pause and look, pause and look, every 10 degrees and scan just like that. You don't have to get in a hurry, but you do have to pause and look for traffic. Prior to any maneuver, visually scan the entire area for collision avoidance. Any aircraft that appears to have no relative motion is likely to be on a collision course. If a target shows no lateral or vertical motion but increases in size, take evasive action. This 10 degrees is what we're going to use to measure our separation. Now, whenever. No, no, no. This 10 degrees we're going to use for our scanning purposes. For scanning purposes, okay. This 10 degrees is what we're going to use for scanning purposes. Now, whenever you're flying in VFR conditions, you must continuously scan for traffic to avoid collisions. You must focus your attention outside the cockpit and scan the sky slowly and systematically to detect a moving aircraft. Focus on small sections of the sky at a time, no more than 10 degrees wide, to avoid overwhelming your eyes with the entire sky. Use small, evenly spaced eye movements don't dart your eyes back and forth. Before starting a turn or other maneuver, visually scan the entire area for traffic. Any aircraft that appears to have no relative motion is likely to be on a collision course. If the aircraft increases in size but doesn't move, take evasive action. When climbing or descending in VFR, make gentle banks right and left and level off occasionally to help you scan all the airspace around you. Haze reduces the ability to see traffic or train during flight, making all features appear to be further away than they actually are. Take note of hazy conditions when you get a pre-flight briefing. It's important to remember, however, that 81% of mid-air collisions and close calls occur in clear skies and unrestricted visibility conditions, all the more reason to keep your scan active. To improve your ability to see other traffic at night, Avoid bright white lights for at least 30 minutes before takeoff. You need to be prepared for the higher density traffic at airports with control towers and ATIS can help you plan to fly the appropriate traffic pattern. Automated Terminal Information Service or ATIS is an important element of collision avoidance. ATIS is one way to prepare and plan your traffic pattern. ATIS provides weather information such as ceilings, visibility, temperature and dew point, altimeter setting, and runway in use. Let's listen to an example. Welcome back. Let's cover a couple of questions on collision avoidance. Prior to starting each maneuver, pilots should A, B, or C. One is correct. All right, let's tackle the answer here. Prior to starting each maneuver, pilots should B, visually scan the entire area for collision avoidance. And a reminder, scanning the sky for other aircraft is a key factor in collision avoidance. Question number two. Automatic Terminal Information Service is the continuous broadcast of recorded information concerning which of these three? All right, let's see if you selected the correct answer. Automatic Terminal Information Service is the continuous broadcast of recorded information concerning C, non-control information in selected high-activity terminal areas. ATIS provides non-control information in those selected high-activity terminal areas. Now, Laurel, there's a lot to juggle in the cockpit. I think we both know that. Charts, flight plans, pilot supplies. It's critical pilots keep their heads up. So uh, what are your suggestions for good cockpit management? I like to keep my charts and airport facility directory handy where I know that I can find them. 
notes in my lap and close by. It's very easy for charts and books to slip under the seat. And as you're flying in a busy, in busy airspace, your focus should be outside. Your focus should be outside the cockpit, not inside scrambling and looking for charts. Okay, let's move on to another topic. This one, special VFR. Okay, we're making great progress. Next up is special VFR. The final airport operations we'll discuss is special VFR. Special VFR procedures allow you to take off or land at an airport in controlled airspace when the weather is below basic VFR minimums. If the weather is slightly below the VFR minimums, you can call the nearest ATC facility or flight service station and ask for a special VFR clearance. This is a clearance that allows you to take off if you know that you will quickly enter VFR conditions outside the controlled airspace. Special VFR is not always available at all airports. How do you know if special VFR is allowed at a specific airport? Airports that don't permit special VFR operations are indicated by the words no SVFR on charts as shown here and in the airport facility directory. Busy airports with many IFR flights often don't allow special VFR operations because they would interfere with the efficient flow of airline traffic. Well, no question for you on special VFR, but do study up for it before your exam. Let's move on to another topic, very special topic, this one, flight physiology. You already know that the FAA requires pilots to have a current medical certificate when acting as pilot in command. But flight physiology also deals with decisions you make before every flight to determine if you're fit to take off. Several physiological factors can impair pilot performance. We'll start off with a condition called hypoxia. Hypoxia is a leading cause of pilot impairment. It's a condition found at high altitude flight. Now, it's easily remedied with supplemental aviation oxygen. Hi, I'm Roger Stenbach, and this is a cannula. It provides oxygen for high altitude flying, and you can use these cannulas up to about 18,000 feet. Above 18,000 feet, the FAA wants you to use a full face mask that, that covers both your mouth and your nose as well. Uh, but these are pretty handy. I always encourage my, the, my, my pilot friends to put on oxygen, uh, maybe when they get up to about 8,000 feet or higher, especially at night, it'll make you feel better. And these are very convenient, just put them on like this, and snug them up here like this. Notice I can talk, I can use my headset, and also easily put my sunglasses on. So there you go, oxygen for high altitude flying. Hypoxia is generally a reduction in oxygen when at higher altitudes. At high altitude, our body tissue can't absorb sufficient oxygen due to the reduced pressure. We become hypoxic. Most of us can function well at altitudes below about 12,000 feet. But many factors, for example, your age, general physical condition, and whether you smoke can make you more susceptible to hypoxia. So take 12,000 feet as a guideline. The signs of hypoxia also vary, and the onset of symptoms may be gradual and subtle. Common symptoms include poor judgment, memory loss, headache, coordination, or problems of dizziness, or a feeling of euphoria. You may also notice a bluish color on the fingernails or on the lips. Pilots and flight crews must use supplemental oxygen when operating an aircraft for 30 minutes or more at pressure altitudes above 12,500 feet MSL, up to and including 14,000 feet MSL. When you're flying above 15,000 feet MSL, every occupant of the aircraft must be provided with supplemental oxygen. The oxygen must be aviation breathing oxygen. The best way to deal with hypoxia is to avoid it in the first place. Be vigilant of the symptoms of hypoxia, especially if you plan to fly at high altitude. It's good to bring along a second pilot to help you detect early signs of hypoxia. 
Now above 15,000 feet, a pilot's performance can seriously deteriorate within just 15 minutes. You also need a supply of supplemental oxygen that you can breathe through a nasal cannula or a mask. If you start to experience any symptoms of hypoxia and you don't have supplemental oxygen available, descend to a lower altitude. Another physiological problem that can affect a pilot is hyperventilation. Now here, our pilot is flying into some challenging weather. He might experience some hyperventilation. Hyperventilation is caused by having too little carbon dioxide in the body. When you're excited, tensed, stressed, or frightened, you may breathe too rapidly and exhale more carbon dioxide than normal. Symptoms of hyperventilation include drowsiness, hot and cold tingling in fingers and toes, and nausea. You can overcome these symptoms by breathing more slowly than normal. Talking out loud also helps to reduce your breathing rate. Sometimes breathing into a paper bag may help, but remember that could be difficult to do in flight. Carbon monoxide is a colorless and odorless but very deadly gas. It's caused by exhaust gases entering the cockpit coming through the heater which may have a leaky heat muff. Carbon monoxide has 200 times the attraction to the red blood cells than oxygen, reducing oxygen saturation levels. Carbon monoxide poisoning is aggravated by high altitude flying. Symptoms include confused thinking, uneasiness, headache, blurred vision, dizziness, or tightening across the forehead. If you suspect carbon monoxide poisoning, you want to open any vents, turn any oxygen to maximum flow, and land as soon as possible. Our eyes are designed for excellent daytime vision in full color. In bright light, your eyes use two types of sensors to sense motion and detect objects and distinguish colors. Those two sensors, called rods and cones, allow you to see clearly in a large area. Rods, which spread over the surface of the retina at the back of your eye, help you detect movement. The cones concentrate at the center of the retina. They detect color and allow you to see objects in the center of your field of view. The cones don't work well in low light, so at night you have a blind spot directly in the center of your field of view. However, motion and monochrome vision is provided by the rods and allow you to detect objects off-center in your field of view. Visual illusions cause problems for pilots. For example, illusions can lead to spatial disorientation, the feeling that you can't tell right side up from upside down. Spatial disorientation results when conflicting information is sent to the brain by different sensory organs. Let's look at one visual illusion that can lead to spatial disorientation. Now, here's an aircraft flying at night above a sloping cloud deck. A pilot who uses the sloping cloud deck as a reference for the horizon could think that the aircraft is straight and level when, in fact, it's in a bank. Following a false horizon can cause the airplane to enter a rapidly descending spiral. To avoid spatial disorientation, you must learn to trust the flight instruments when you can't clearly distinguish the horizon. Now let's take a look at a visual illusion that can be caused by haze. Haze restricts your vision and makes it difficult to see other aircraft and obstacles. Besides reducing visibility, haze can make objects such as a runway seem farther away than they really are. This effect can cause you to fly a lower approach than normal. Haze makes traffic and train features appear further away than their actual distance. When you're flying in hazy skies, be especially aware of these hazards. All right, regarding our topic, flight physiology, we have four questions for you. Question number one, which statement best defines hypoxia? A, B, or C, one correct answer. I think we all got this one, but let's check. Which statement best defines hypoxia? A, a state of oxygen deficiency in the body. Okay, question number two. Which would most likely result in hyperventilation? A, B, or C? All right, the answer, which would most likely result in hyperventilation? A, emotional tension, anxiety, or fear? By way of further explanation, excitement, anxiety, and fear causes rapid breathing and an excess amount of carbon dioxide. 
Okay, question number three. Susceptibility to carbon monoxide poisoning increases as A, B, or C, one correct answer. The one correct answer, susceptibility to carbon monoxide poisoning increases as A, altitude increases. Final question for this topic. The danger of spatial disorientation during flight in poor visual conditions may be reduced by which of these, A, B, or C? You have your answer? Okay. The question again. The danger of spatial disorientation during flight in poor visual conditions may be reduced by B. Having faith in the instruments rather than taking the chance on the sensory organs. All right, let's move on to our final topic. The topic is aeronautical decision making. Action. Safe aircraft operation is a systematic process. As a pilot in command, you are responsible for determining whether you are fit and ready to fly. Many aviation accidents are caused by human error, and good aeronautical decision-making can help prevent mistakes. Aeronautical decision-making is a systematic approach to the mental process used by pilots to determine the best course of action in response to a given set of circumstances. You should follow a series of well-ordered steps to ensure good decision-making. First, you should recognize attitudes that people possess that can lead to dangerous situations. You also need to be aware of behavior modification techniques that can help reverse hazardous attitudes. You also need to learn how to recognize and deal with stress. As a pilot in command, you must assess the risks associated with a particular flight. All flying involves some degree of risk but we can minimize risk by taking into account all the factors that are related to a particular flight and using that analysis to make sensible decisions. You should use all the available resources that you have as a pilot. This means if you have a co-pilot or other people in the airplane, use them to your advantage. Don't have the attitude that you have to do everything yourself. The first behavioral pitfall is peer pressure. Most of us understand that peer pressure comes from friends or family that may be flying with us. They may make demands, or you may not want to disappoint them by canceling or ending a flight before you reach your destination. But you're the pilot, and the decision must rest with you. Don't give in to peer pressure. Another problem is known as get their itis. This is the strong desire to get to a final destination, even if continuing a flight could be dangerous due to bad weather, pilot fatigue, or other factors. Get their itis can get a lot of pilots, but don't let it get you. If you're feeling pressure to complete a flight as planned, you might be tempted to try to sneak under a lowering cloud deck. This type of flying is often called scud running, and it can be deadly, especially in an area of rising terrain or worsening weather, which may soon be IMC. Scud running is just one scenario that arises from peer pressure or other behavioral pitfalls. It's part of a general problem called continuing from visual flight rules into instrument conditions. You can fall into this trap if you think you can sneak through an area of bad weather and you don't want to or you can't get an IFR clearance. Pressing on often means pressing your luck. Now the last behavioral pitfall is sometimes called flying outside the envelope. Pilots who want to show off or think their skills exceed those of the aircraft designer may fall prey to this behavior. Two of the most dangerous words in aviation are, watch this. The behavioral traps we've discussed often arise from specific hazardous attitudes. Pilots should be aware of these attitudes and how to counteract them. The first attitude is anti-authoritarian. People who have had an anti-authority attitude think that the rules aren't correct or that they don't apply to them. The antidote is to remind yourself to follow the rules. They exist for a reason and they're probably correct. The next hazardous attitude is being impulsive. An impulsive pilot acts before thinking. 
you can see that this can get you into a lot of trouble in the cockpit. To counteract impulse actions, remind yourself, not so fast, think first. Invulnerability is another hazardous attitude. Pilots who think that they are invulnerable believe that accidents can't possibly happen to them, only to the other guy. If you sense this hazardous attitude, remind yourself that accidents can happen to anyone. Pilots with a macho attitude may take great risks because they think they have above normal attitude, ability, and experience. If you recognize this hazardous attitude, remind yourself that taking chances is foolish. The last hazardous attitude we'll discuss is resignation. In a tense situation, some pilots give up. They feel they aren't able to do anything, that they're helpless, and that they can't possibly change anything and make the outcome better. This is a very dangerous attitude, and if you feel this way, remind yourself that you are not helpless and you can always do something to resolve the situation. Let's talk about cockpit stress management. Certainly there's stress involved when flying an aircraft and you want to try to minimize that stress as much as possible. So first, try to avoid distractions. Distraction, such as a talkative passenger, could disrupt your attention to important details. Don't be afraid to remind passengers that critical phases of flight, such as takeoff and landing, require your full attention. Reduce your workload as much as possible. If you get into a tight situation and have devices in the cockpit, such as an autopilot or a GPS, that could help you, then you want to use them. You should also remain calm in an emergency. Now, that's easy to say because, by definition, an emergency raises your stress level. But try to take a deep breath and remember to remain calm. This will help you think through your actions before you do them. Use the checklists to help you do the right thing in the right order. You want to maintain proficiency in the aircraft that you are flying. A proficient pilot is a more confident pilot. Also, know your personal limits and don't push them. And don't let little mistakes bother you until they distract you and cause a big problem. If you make a little mistake in the cockpit, don't sweat it. Debrief yourself after landing. And finally, don't let flying add to the stress level in your life. If you're facing a tense work or personal situation, don't add flying to the mix. Deal with that stress first and then fly. To help you sort through the human factors maze, let's consider a six-step process that provides a logical approach to decision making. This is the decide model. The first step in decision making is detecting an issue or problem. Use your senses to detect what is happening in the cockpit and identify the situation. Next, you want to estimate the need to react to the problem. Is this a serious problem that needs immediate attention or is it something small that you can deal with later? Now you're ready to choose the desired result. And with a resolution in mind, you identify the steps that are necessary to bring about the outcome that you've just decided on and you do the necessary actions. The final step is evaluating whether your action resolved the issue. If not, rewind your mind and start the decide process again. Following the decide model is an effective way to organize your thoughts and dealing with situations in the cockpit, but it does take practice. So learn these steps and apply the decide model. Okay, three final questions on aeronautical decision making. Question one. What is the one common factor which affects more preventable accidents? A, B, or C? Should know this one. What is the one common factor which affects more preventable accidents? Answer C, human error. Who would have thought? Okay, question number two. What is the correct antidote when a pilot has a hazardous attitude, such as invulnerability? A, B, or C? Let's answer that for you. What is the correct antidote when a pilot has a hazardous attitude such as invulnerability? C, it could happen to me. Of course it could, remember that. Question number three. Who is responsible for determining whether a pilot is fit to fly for a particular flight even though he or she holds a current FAA medical certificate? A, B, or C, who's responsible? 
your final answer to your final question. Who is responsible for determining whether a pilot is fit to fly for a particular flight, even though he or she holds a current FAA medical certificate? The pilot. Now, the private pilot certificate is often called a license to learn. Uh, what are some of the things pilots can do to ensure that they remain proficient and competent after the check ride? Well, ideally, pilots fly often. Fly as often as you can. Go up there and, uh, and enjoy flying. There's no shortcut to proficiency and competency. And once you feel comfortable with your private pilot certificate and the, and the flying that you're doing, go for your instrument rating and your commercial certificate. Even if you never intend to fly in instruments, or become a professional pilot. It will add to your uh, growing bag of tools and uh, it certainly improve your skills. And then hang out with other pilots. Go to the airport, join aviation clubs, listen to hangar stories and tell your own hangar stories. My theory is share your mistakes. And the more mistakes that a pilot's willing to share, the better the pilot. Attend safety seminars and of course, read aviation magazines. Take a mountain flying course aerobatic instruction, get your seat plane rating, and remember all that flying will be fun while you're learning it and you're becoming a better pilot in the process. I flew with eight different instructors in 10 years of training and all of those people taught uh, differently and different methods of training and what it taught me was that I can learn something from everyone and I advise you to just get out there and fly. Well that wraps up our lesson number five. When you're ready, join Dave Seleski for lesson number six weather concepts.